quite a few scriptures that I'm referencing this morning, and so I've got them printed out, so it's not going to have to be where you turn to everyone. You might want to write down the scripture references so that you can go and look at them yourself. Um, but first of all, this morning, uh, defining the word blessing. A blessing is experiencing, enjoying, and extending the goodness of God in your life. The definition in the, uh, the Webster definition on blessed is enjoying happiness, bringing pleasure, contentment, or good fortune, enjoying the bliss of heaven. Amen. In Psalms 128 verses 1 and 2 it says, How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways when you shall eat the fruit of your hands, you will be happy, and it will be well with you. Okay. The fear of the Lord is the foundational principle for God working in our lives. Yeah. In Isaiah 33, verses 5 and 6, it says, The Lord is exalted, for He dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. And He will be the stability of your times. A wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Mm -hmm. The fear of the Lord opens up treasure. Opens up God's treasure, I mean. Mm -hmm. the fear, to fear God means to take God seriously. Yes. When we decide to take God seriously, we begin to, we begin to see him unfold his purpose and his blessings that he has des destined for us. Amen. Turn this morning, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. And let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord God, for your many, many blessings. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we pray that as we spend time in your word today and reference your scriptures, that you would bring revelation to us, Father God. Revelation that enlightens us. Revelation that makes us uncomfortable. Yes. Revelation that brings healing and liberty. Yes. Yes. And Father, we thank you for the truth of your word today. Let it all be you, Lord God, today and none of me. And we thank you, Father, for your many, many blessings. You, Sherry asked me earlier this week, do I have a title for the message? And I didn't. I struggled for weeks and putting this message together because I knew what God put on my heart but I didn't know how to get there and what he wanted me to share. So this morning the title of my message is The Fear of the Lord and the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. So in Matthew chapter 5 we're going to start reading in verse 1 it says when he saw the crowds he went up on the mountain and after he sat down his disciples came to him then he began to teach them, saying, in verse 3 it says, The poor in spirit are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus begins his sermon with words that contradict each other. But God's way of living usually contradicts the world. Amen. 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 If you want to live for God, you must be ready to say and do what seems strange to the world. In other words, what we're talking about is you must be willing to give when others take. To love when others hate. To help when others abuse. And by giving up our own rights in order to serve others. You will then receive everything God has in store for you. Amen. Amen. It's called delayed gratification. Because we do what He's called us to do. We follow His example. Isaiah, 55 verse, uh, Isaiah 57 verse 15 says, For thus says the Lord, an exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place. I dwell on a high and holy place. But listen to this. And also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. 
in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. In other words, he was in that perfect place. He was high and exalted, and he was where he belongs to be. But he chose to leave that place to come to us, yes. to partner with us, to be there for us, to walk with us through our challenges and our struggles. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This is what it means to be poor in spirit. But the reward of that is that he says very clearly, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. In order for us to accomplish this, James chapter 4 and verse 10 tells us, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Look at verse 4. Those who mourn are blessed, for they will be comforted. Now to correctly understand this verse, it needs to be read this way. Those who mourn, in other words, there's a loss to be mourned, and then are comforted, then they are blessed or healed. Y'all get that? Amen. Which is a total contradiction to what the world says. What does the world tell us? Yeah, bad things happen, happen get over it. Mm. Suck it up, move on. When my son was playing football and he fell and got hurt, I said, rub some dirt on it, you'll be fine. Okay. Okay. Right? And that is what the world tells us. Get over it. Mm -hmm. But God never says get over it. Amen. God never says suck it up and move on. But God, God's plan for us is that we have to be healed. Amen. We don't need to deny that we have pain. Amen. Whether it be spiritual, emotional, or physical pain, we don't need to deny it. Amen. There's a need for us to be comforted. And so when we experience, first of all, the mourning, there's a loss to be mourned. And then we receive comfort. Well, how do we receive comfort? We receive comfort from each other. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Think about it a minute. Oh, well, God will take care of that. No, what God is saying is we need each other. Amen. Okay? Yes. You see, Jesus told us, all authority has been given to me and has, has been given unto me, I give unto you. Yes. We're told that we are joint heirs with Christ. Yes. Right? Amen. Jesus himself said, greater things than these that I have done will you do and more. So everything that was given to Jesus has been given to us. Amen. Therefore, we have the ability to comfort those who mourn. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles real quick to Isaiah 61, if you would. This is Isaiah's prophet that we saw lived out in Jesus in the book of Luke when he walked into the temple and he picked up the scroll. You remember this? And when he picked up the scroll, he said these words. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. Verse 2 says, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor and the day of of our God's vengeance to comfort all who mourn. And so we saw this lived out in Jesus so many times when we see somebody that's been hurting, we kind of just say, well, the Lord bless you, the Lord will comfort you. But we're missing the opportunity to be a blessing and to receive a blessing by following Christ. Because Christ told us we have what he has. Y'all see that? In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have received. Yes. You see, comfort is stewardship. Do y'all get this? Amen. It is. We have received comfort from God for the things that we've gone through, the experiences we've had, that we've experienced. You know, going through a divorce in my life was the most painful experience of my life. 
Okay? But then God called me to minister to those so they don't have to go through that pain. Right. Amen. And to minister to those that have gone through the pain. Yes. He comforted me. He sent people into my life that helped me to walk and grow and heal. Amen. And then he said, now, Mike, steward what's been given to you. Mm-hmm. You see, that's God's intention for us. Amen. And the Bible says right here in the Beatitudes that blessed are those who comfort. Those that, I'm sorry, that mourn. And then are comforted. And so we want to be a good steward of what God has bestowed on us so that we can pass it on to others. Y'all with me? Yeah. Look at verse 5. Again, I'm on Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. It says, The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Another translation says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now let me make this perfectly clear. Meekness is not weakness. Amen. Okay? Meekness is humility. Mm-hmm. And that means that we cannot be self-sufficient. Amen. Think about it for a minute. I got this. In Psalms 37, verses 5 through 11 tells us, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in Him, and He will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger. How many times have you heard people say, i got a right to be angry? Mm. That's not meekness. Forsake wrath. Do not fret. So many times when we're faced with a challenge, we, we refuse to let others partner with us. We say we're going to handle this on our own, and that's not meekness. And what do we do when we're trying to handle it on our own? We're fretful, aren't we? Yes. Well, listen to the next part of this verse. It says, do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. In other words, the only thing that comes out of a fretful heart is evil. Y'all getting this? Yes. For evil doers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. So you see, we're told to be meek or gentle, which means we can't just say, I'm going to do it on my own power and strength. If you haven't figured it out yet, you can't do it in your own power and strength. So then what do we do? How do we develop this attitude? Well, very clearly in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He is our example. Amen? Amen. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So learning to be meek is simply following the example we have in Christ. Watching what He did, studying what He did, and applying it to our own lives. Let's look at verse 6 again in chapter 5. It says, Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, for they will be filled. The clashing worldly view to this is all about strength without feelings. Do you need mercy today? Yes. I will tell you that Mike Bihar is addicted to God's mercy. I need all that I can get. So how do we receive mercy? Well, in Luke chapter 6... Starting in verse 37, it says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. 
Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Given it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure it will be measured to you in return. So in other words, if you want mercy, give mercy. If you want grace, give grace. If you want to hold on to unforgiveness, then God will not forgive you. Now, don't blame me. That's what the Word of God says, because it says right there, by whatever standard you measure it out, God's going to measure it to you. So we need to be willing to extend all the mercy we can to people, because we need all the mercy we can get. You all agree with that? Yes. Psalms 41 and verse 1 says, How blessed is he who... I'm sorry. How blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. Praise God. Ooh, thank you, Lord. You see? Yeah. We need God's blessings. Yes. We want God's blessings. And so we're doing an outreach today to reach this community. Yes. To extend to them the love of Christ. Mm-hmm. To help the helpless. You all with me? You understand what I'm saying? Yes. And when the day comes that we're in a situation that appears helpless to us, He's there for us. Why? Because we gave. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Right? Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. I will tell you that I pondered this verse for some time. David said, search my heart, O God, and know me. Right? Reveal to me my anxiety and teach me the way everlasting. David had a heart to see God reveal his own heart to him. And folks, we need to be at that place that we are willing to say, God, you tell me to have a pure heart. What is it in my heart that is corruptible? Mm -hmm. The world's counterfeit to purity in heart is that deception is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Think about it. As children of God with a healthy fear of Him can't live that way. In Psalms 24 verses 3 and 4 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in His holy holy place? Excuse me. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and is not sworn deceitfully. The reward for having a pure heart is that we get to see God. Mm -hmm. I want to see God. It means that we must surrender our will. In 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 tells us, Look at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when He appears... We will be with Him because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who has hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. The process of sanctification in our lives is pursuing purity. Verse 9 The peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called sons of God. Once again, we see a contradiction to the culture of today's world. 
which is defined as personal peace is pursued without concern for the world's chaos. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 19 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. <clears throat> Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourself. Instead, leave room for his wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, says the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 and 11 tells us, For they disciplined us for a short time, based on what seemed good to them. But he does it for our profit, so that we may share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the fruit of peace and righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Verses 10 11. I'm sorry, verses 10 through 12. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You will be blessed when they insult and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. He says, be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how the, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Folks, persecution is coming. Yes. Yeah. If you think it's not, you have your head in the sand. Yeah. Right now, our government, our very own government, is attempting to criminalize Christianity. Yes. The mandate against the gathering that we just went through was just a trial run That's right. for how they can get away with it and take away our freedoms. As elders of this church, we spent the better part of the last two months rewriting the bylaws of this church. Why? To protect ourselves from our own government. Mm -hmm. Persecution is coming. And we need to know that. We need to be aware of it. We need to prepare for it. Yeah. There, is a, there is a teaching that says that because we are the Lord's, we have his favor and we're not going to suffer. We're not going to be persecuted. Well, that's not what God says. No. There is going to be persecution. Yes. And we need to be prepared because what are you going to do when persecution comes? When they say to you, you cannot gather together and, and pray together, are you going to do it anyway? We are going to be persecuted, church. Second Timothy chapter three, chapter three, verse twelve says, "In fact, all those who want to live godly life in Christ will be persecuted." <laughs> Now, how much clearer can it be? We need to understand that this is coming. And we need to prepare ourselves. But there's blessings in this. How? Because we fear the Lord. Yes. Amen. I fear my Lord more than I fear my government. Amen. Right? Amen. I am thankful that in this city, in this community, our mayor and our sheriff have said, I will not persecute anybody that goes to church. Okay. I mean, we're blessed, folks, because there are a lot of places in this country that pastors are being arrested for having church services. Okay. Pastors are being arrested, not just pastors, but, but for the most part, we see it in pastors being arrested for speaking the truth of God's word. What does God's word say about marriage? One man, one woman. You know, what does God's word say about sex outside of marriage? No. 
You see, when we stand up and we preach the Word of God, then we are going against the culture of our country today. I listened to a prophecy uh, from Jonathan Kahn this week that was just powerful about the fact that he parallels so much of where we are today out of what's, what we experienced, what was experienced in the Old Testament. It was a powerful, powerful testimony. So what we need to understand is that there are at least four ways to understand the Beatitudes. The first is, they are a code of ethics for the disciples and a standard of conduct for all believers. They contrast kingdom values, which is eternal, with worldly values, which is temporal or temporary. They contrast superficial faith of the Pharisees with the faith, the real faith, Christ desires from us. And number four, they show how Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled in the new kingdom. We can read the Beatitudes and we can get all excited because it says we're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed. But wait a minute. What we read today and what we understand today is that the blessings of God come from the fear of the Lord. The Beatitudes are not multiple choice. You don't get to pick the one you want to apply and disregard the rest. We have to take the whole. They describe what we should be like as Christ followers. Each beatitude tells us how to be blessed, and it begins with the fear of the Lord. In closing today, I'd like for you to listen to this song that I found this week, and it just really speaks to the determination that we need to fear the Lord. We are commanded to fear the Lord. And that fear is not just a trembling or a, a running away from because he's big and mighty. It's a reverential fear. Yes. It's a holy fear. It's a worshipful fear. Yes. Father God, we thank you for the privilege and the honor it is to come together this morning and worship you. Amen. And Father, we determine in our hearts to fear you. Yes. Fear you with that, that worship and that praise that you are due. And Lord, today we join our hearts to pray over this property. That the Spirit of the Lord God would dwell here today. And that as people come on this property today, Lord God, that they would encounter the very presence of your Holy Spirit. That would soften and prepare hearts that many might come to know you as Lord and Savior today. Father, that we would see you do great things. We pray for safety for everybody that's here. That you would protect and minister. And that you would provide all that is needed for this event today, Lord God. It is not about new life. It's not about a single person that's here, but it's all about you, Lord. And so our heart's desire and our wish is to see you glorified today. Help each one of us that are working today to walk in love and peace and share the goodness of God with every person that we meet today, Lord. And God, we will always be careful to give you glory and praise in Jesus' name.